to the Neshoba Regional School Committee regular meeting of January 3rd, 2018. Calling the meeting to order at 6 o'clock. Um, our first item on the agenda is citizens' comments. Um, before I start <coughs> entertaining citizens' comments, I've got a couple things I want to read to you folks. Um, so bear with me. Um, the first thing I want to do is make sure everybody um, understands that school committee meetings are business meetings that are held in public. They're not town meetings. So at a town meeting or an annual meeting, you can walk up to the front of the room and you can speak into the microphone and anybody who wants to talk can and sometimes there's debates. That's not what happens at a school committee meeting. This is a, this is a business meeting. Um, we are bound by district policy. Come on in district policy and mass general law on how these meetings are going to be conducted so I'm going to review generally as I have in the past with the policies but I'm also going to share with you the mass general law that dictates what happens in a um, public meeting we have two policies for the district um, one is policy KE and in a nutshell that one basically says that the session is intended for brief comments or for input of information that requires little or no further discussion not intended for debate. There's also policy VEDH. Um, that's the one that guides me in identifying do we want to have public meeting or public meeting citizens comments because we don't have to have citizens comments. I want you all to understand that. Um, and the time limit is a general rule. Um, it's a chance for you to share your comments. It's not a chance for us to have a discussion. We have other venues for that, as you know. Um, and um, your comments need to be directed to me, lucky me, um, not to the, the school committee or individual members. We can't have you speak to any individual, whether it's a student, even your student, um, a staff member, or a school committee member. And we cannot, cannot hear complaints about them um, to ensure different view viewpoints I'm going to ask that th that whoever speaks doesn't um, recreate the comments of the speaker before them because we want to give people a chance to have an opportunity to share different viewpoints um, if I ask you to stop speaking and if you and, and the reason I would do that is you're out of order or your comments are out of order. If you persist, I can terminate this chair. Let me, re, let me use that third person here. The chair may terminate the individual's privilege of address. Now, we also have mass general law that protects public meetings. And I am going to read that um, section of the law to you. And I want you to understand that we're going to hold to this, especially given the event of the last school committee meeting when we were in this room. It's Mass General Law 30A, Section 20G, for anyone who wants to look it up. And it says, no person shall address a meeting of a public body without permission of the chair, and all persons shall, at the request of the chair, be silent. I'm going to stop myself here. One of the things that school committee members learn when we first get on the board is there's a difference between may and shall. May says you have a choice. Shall, you don't have a choice. That's what you have to do. No person shall disrupt the proceedings of a meeting of a public body if after clear warning from the chair a person continues to disrupt the meetings, the proceedings, the chair may order the person to withdraw from the meeting and if the person does not withdraw, the chair may authorize a constable or other officer to remove the person from the meeting. Thank you very much to the Bolton Police Department and to Town Manager Don Lowe for having police presence here tonight. I'm hoping this is not something we have to continue to do based on what happened at the last school committee meeting. At our last school committee meeting, three residents shared their comments with us. Each speaker was passionate, articulate, respectful, and appropriate in their comments, and we do genuinely appreciate you bringing those comments for, uh, forward to us. Unfortunately, we had to recess the December 6th meeting due to a Stowe parent who chose to interrupt our meeting, and according to his own admission, quote, had a deliberate intent to disrupt and quote our meeting those actions upset many people in the room both folks sitting in the audience school committee members and people on the administrative team the vast majority of people who come to speak to our meetings respect the guidelines and we do thank you for that 
But if there are further disruptions, like the one we had on December 6th, which occurred in one of our schools, one of our safe spaces, I will, we will, exercise every option we have to protect our meetings and the people who attend them, which may include suspending citizens' comments for the foreseeable future. We don't want to do that. We want to hear what you have to say. But if something like that happens again, the number one thing in education when I first came on the school committee was, and it was drilled into us, safety is the number one. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. You have kids in this district. Safety is number one. And in our schools, safety rules. So if that happens again, we're going to suspend citizens' comments. Okay? <coughs> so I'm going to take a few comments tonight. I am going to ask that people are um, cognizant of what's been said in the past and what uh, anyone who goes before them tonight says as well because if we start to um, hear the same comments I'm probably going to stop you and ask that you not speak because we've got a, a lot to get through tonight I'm also going to ask that we maintain um, the three minute time limit I know that sounds rigid but given the fact that we're going to have folks speaking and we've got a lot on the agenda um, I want to make sure we get through that so in deference to you so that you're not cut off at the last minute and I don't want to do that I'm going to ask Lynn to give you a 15 second um, heads up just so you can wrap up your comments okay all right who has a comment for us tonight one two two people okay what I would love for you to do is to give us your name and the town that you're from and if you could tell me what the agenda item is that you're referencing. Sure. Um, my name is Joelle Spear. I live in Stowe and I'm referencing the kindergarten item on tonight's agenda. Okay. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak and thank you for what you do for the towns. I think it's great. Um, in regard to current statistics, according to the Department of Elementary Education, 83% of Massachusetts is enrolled in free full day kindergarten. Um, only 56 communities charge tuition. We are one of those communities. In March, you voted to increase tuition $150. I would like to see that bus turn around so that we have a plan. Maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years. Maybe it takes a while. But I think we should turn that bus around until kindergarten is free. The state of Commonwealth has spoken. People want full three day kindergarten. Um, Kate Hogan has reached out, I believe, to the superintendent for a meeting regarding this topic in pre-K just to get her handle on more um, ideas and get the conversation flowing and I hope that the um, parents can be part of that process too so that we can have some feedback. This meeting time is very difficult for um, working families and little children as you know. Um, so why full day kindergarten? Maybe you think it's too much for the kids. I have a document that I'd like to pass around because I know I'm limited to three minutes. So if you can just take one and pass it around, there's been. Did you give those to Alita and she'll get them to us? Yep. Thanks. There's been several studies um, that have been done over the country stating why full day kindergarten is more beneficial than half day for children. Um, for example, it allows less stress for the children by allowing a more consistent schedule where you can space out the activities with playtime in between. Full day kindergartners spend. 30% uh, more time reading and 46% more time on math and they have more instruction time for learning activities such as group lead or where the <coughs> kids can initiate activities which may be out of the realm of the academic purposes but it really is helpful for the kids. Um, in a study in Philadelphia 17,600 children were studied and it finds that low income families perform better and save the district's millions of dollars through the reduced grade retention in first through third grade. So I could go on and on, but you have the document. Um, the further comment is that the PowerPoint presentation originally had a bullet point about lottery. I know you have since taken that out because that was a subject for discussion. Um, I would beg of you please not to bring back the lottery. We're already behind 83% of the state by not having free folded kindergarten. The lottery seems to make that situation worse. Furthermore, if you weren't gonna do the lottery decision until March, Working families would be enrolling in private pre-K or private wraparound programs now. So if you wait till March, it's too late. Kids a lot will be full of other schools in town. Um, so working families, what are you gonna do if you get that half day spot? Uh, if you were forced in a half day spot for the lottery and you work, then you might have to go to private school and they might not use the foundations and envision math program that center school and some of the other schools use in our district now. Yep. 
And um, if a parent was looking to re-enter the workforce, knowing in March might be too late for their job search. So thank you for your time, and I'm going to go home and see my children. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. I appreciate the fact that you um, had your succinct okay. comments for us. Appreciate that. Okay, I saw another hand. Okay, your name and your town and your topic. Uh, hi, my name is Ann Ogilvie, and I am from Lancaster, and my topic are the cuts to the integrated preschool program. Okay. Um, and I, while I'm here tonight representing myself, I also would like to read from the petition that was recently circulated um, and now has over 260 signatures from citizens from the towns of Lancaster, Bolton, and Stowe. And Chairwoman Ramasco, with your permission, I would also like to ask if parents who did sign the petition, while they may not be able to speak, if they could raise their hands to say that they have signed the petition. Well, I'll tell you what, you're, you've got something that you want us to take a look at. I'm assuming that those names are on that petition. I'm assuming that many of them are here tonight, and this is your time to talk to us. So why don't you do what you need to do? Give her the three minutes starting now. Yeah. Yeah, give her the full three now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ann? Thank you. All right. And it's abridged. What's <laughs> it's abridged? It's abridged for three minutes. Format. Good job. <laughs> uh, we are alarmed by and do not support the recent proposal by the Neshoba Regional School District administrative team and subsequent decision by the Neshoba Regional School District School Committee to dramatically reduce the size of the existing preschool program by 44% for the 2018-19 school year. This decision resulted in the loss of 75 preschool seats in a district already challenged with limited access to affordable, high-quality preschool options. In light of the lack of a demonstrated case for programmatic or financial urgency for this decision, we respectfully request that the Neshoba Regional School District School Committee and Superintendent Clenchy reaffirm and act upon your stated commitments to both early childhood education and collaboration. We ask the following. Number one, that you suspend any action related to the vote from the Neshoba Regional School District School Committee meeting on Wednesday, November 29th, 2017, related to realigning preschool services and cutting spaces until a comprehensive early childhood education plan for the district has been <coughs> created and approved by the school committee. And number two, we ask that you appoint, that the superintendent appoint a committee that includes representation from all stakeholders, parents, administrators, educators, citizens, and Neshoba Regional School District school committee representatives to engage in a process to develop a vision and a three to five year strategy for a comprehensive early childhood education plan for the district that includes preschool and kindergarten. This plan should include a needs assessment, public listening sessions, benchmarking from the state of Massachusetts and beyond, financial modeling, and substantial stakeholder engagement. We recognize that change is sometimes necessary and acknowledge that efficiencies in the current structure can no doubt be gained. However, <coughs> we believe that a stronger model of early childhood education must be developed through collaboration with stakeholders. We can and must do better. We truly, tr we truly believe that first-rate public education is our community's most valuable asset, and we look forward to building a better plan for early childhood education in partnership with you. And as I mentioned, 260 people have signed this as of this morning. Can you give that to Alita? But before you do, could you write for me the names of the authors of that document? Yes, I'm happy to do that. And the authors have also requested a meeting with Superintendent Clinchy, and she's graciously responded. And um, I, I believe we will be arranging a meeting in the near future. Okay, so Anne, what I need you to do is write the names, hand it to Alita so we can put it into the public record, and then um, we'll take it. I'll take that under advisement. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Time? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you all for that. I really appreciate your comments, your thoughtfulness, <coughs> and the appropriateness of your comments. We're going to move on to school committee chairs, and I want you to um, settle in because I have a couple of minutes I need to speak on, on uh, a couple of things here. Um, the first thing is school committee, um, these are obviously comments to you. Um, don't forget the January 20th budget workshop. I think we're starting at 8.30. Alita's already put the agenda together. It is chock full. Um, and I'm really hoping that many of the people that have 
um, specific issues that they're concerned about in the community come and observe that meeting as well so they get a perspective of what we're really looking at in totality with the budget and some of the things that we've got to make decisions on this year. Okay. I'm going to read a press release to you folks because I don't think that the full committee is aware of this. From the Bolton Police Department, the chief of police that was dated December 7th, which was one day after our December 6th school committee meeting. The press release was issued as a direct response to an inquiry from the Bolton and Stowe Independent to learn more about the incident that had occurred during the citizens' comments portion of the previous evening's meeting on December 6th. And this is the press release. The Bolton Police Department was contacted by <coughs> Town Administrator Donald Lowe requesting police assistance at the school committee meeting <coughs> for an individual causing a disturbance. The meeting was put in recess by school committee chairperson Lorraine Ramosco while they awaited the police arrival. I apologize for the pronunciation here because I'm just not sure and I've asked several people and nobody seems to. Um, Mr. George Kirvin, Kivrin from Stowe came to the meeting planning to vocally dispute a school matter. At this time, no charges are being put forward. We do not condone this type of behavior and hope in the future that matters like this can be handled in a more calm, reasonable manner. Now, three weeks later from the time of that meeting, there was an article in the Stowe and Bolton Independent, Pre-K Changes Prompt Concern, that hit Bolton in December 20th and I think Stowe on December 18th, but it didn't include the details of the press release or the concern expressed by the Bolton Chief of Police. Only the Bolton and Stowe Independent can explain to you why the statement was not released to the public in its entirety and in the print edition where the article identifying the reason for the recess appeared. I have talked with so many residents. Bolton and Stowe mainly, couple from Lancaster, Lancaster, and some of you are even in this room over the past several weeks. Um, some, of the, some of the folks that I talked to um, indicated that they were confused because they were either in this room or they watched the meeting um, on their cable channel and then they read the article in the Independent and it didn't appear that they were that they were referencing the same thing and that it was different so a lot of the questions I got was what really happened I really do want to thank every single community member that I've met with every single community member that sent me emails I, I have to tell you that with the exception of one or two but really one everyone has been concerned and really really appropriate we need to hear from you and you know the way you teach your kids the way you talk to us is the way we want to talk to you so like we can do this we can figure this out um, and there's a lot of information that flies around at school committee meetings and a lot of it is regulated and a lot of it is a historical perspective of things that are in the rearview mirror that you might not even know about because you haven't had a <coughs> chance to go back and research that what went on in the rearview mirror but to our community when you have questions and you need facts about anything that's happening at the school committee or at the district level the place to get that information the factual information is on the district website that's the official voice for everything that we do. That's the thing that all the <coughs> lawyers reference. That's where all that information is. If there's ever an error on it, we'll correct it. But for the most part, that stuff is vetted before it's even put up there. You can even watch it on our cable channels. Going forward, I'm going to use the chair's update to fact check any and all inaccuracies. I'm not going to go through every little, because there's too, sometimes there's too many nits but things that are important I'm going to fact check them here and I really am going to ask that you guys you community please I want you to pay attention to that stuff because I think some of what has happened in the past is that wrong information gets out there or half of the information <coughs> gets out there and then the <coughs> void is filled and it may not be filled with the accurate information and that doesn't help swirl Okay, so that said, our support and fact-checking is not going to be limited to the Bolton and Stowe Independent. I don't want it to seem like that's the only outlet. There has been a lot of miscommunication and a lot of misinformation swirling around this district. 
And as the misinformation becomes visible to the school committee, we're going to reach out to level set it, and we're going to turn you back to the website where the official information and the sources will be. You can look at our meeting agendas, you can go into our packets, you can look at our minutes, and I think that the information there is more reliable than invitation-only social media pages or anonymous websites. Okay? So, guys, we will give you the information. I think this school committee over the past couple of years has been pretty diligent in pushing out so much information that sometimes I think people are like, I don't even know where to start. Ask us where to start. We'll take you, we'll take you on the journey that got us to that point. All right, I'm done. <laughs> um, Isabel, it's your turn. Lucky me. Save me <laughs> for myself. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so I'll start off with news from the music department. Um, it's pretty exciting. Next week, four of the high school music students will be taking part in the Central District Music Ensembles. Uh, these four students, there's two seniors, Mark Dakota and Catherine Smith. Junior Renza Morissette and freshman Vivian Stringfellow have auditioned and were accepted to these honorable ensembles. They will rehearse next week at Wachusett High School and perform on Saturday, January 13th at Mechanics Hall in Worcester. There were over a thousand students who auditioned for these ensembles, so it's really, truly a great honor if you were selected. Additionally, Mark received the second highest score for flute in Worcester County and will be auditioning for the All-State Concert Band on um, Saturday, January 20th. Um, from athletics, our athletic director is here tonight, so I'll provide just a quick uh, summary. The winter teams are off to a good start. <coughs> Only a few teams competed over break, and the uh, middle school basketball teams are also doing fairly well in their seasons. Um, DECA will be competing at the district competition at UMass Lowell next uh, week on January 9th, and so lots of members are looking towards that, and then looking towards uh, states that'll come to <coughs> And that's really all I have for you. Well, thank you for that. We appreciate hearing about some good stuff. That's goodness. Superintendent's report. Yeah, it's a short one this time because it's been, it feels like we just left here. So um, it's, it's on a long report tonight. Uh, Rob Frieswick is here tonight. He's going to talk to you a little bit about the deep cleaning that we did um, at the high school over the, the uh, vacation time mm -hmm. period. We worked really, really hard to bring in a company that specializes in sanit uh, sanitizing and deep cleaning. Um, we looked at really high traffic areas, and, and I know between Rob and Tanya, you can kind of fill us in on the key areas that they hit, but we feel really, really good about uh, the amount of work that they, they did, and Rob, you can fill us in on the details when you get up here. Um, MSBA has opened up their SOI, uh, which is really exciting for us. Um, I had forwarded an email that I sent to um, MSBA today. Uh, that's Massachusetts School Building Authority with regards to the fact that the Neshoba Regional District would be wanting to submit an SOI, Statement of Interest, mm -hmm. as we look forward for some help and support with the high school. And what our next steps for the high school is it's aging. Uh, we, we know that we could go on forever around this table but some of the uh, concerns we have about that high school right now. So for us to get ready to take that next step is huge. Uh, the school committee had struck, for those of you that may be new to some of this, had struck a committee earlier this year. That committee went out. I know, Erica, you're here. You sat on that committee. Um, that committee took a look at a lot of the research uh, with, with Bob Sikansky. They came forward and encouraged the school committee to move <coughs> ahead with the submission of an SOI. So my job now, now that they, they just opened that window effective today, is to go ahead and uh, fill out the SOI I'll bring it back to the school committee within the next month or so and then they'll decide um, whether they're going to move forward with it or not but that window just opened today have you had a chance to look at what um, what the SOI fulfillment Details. requirements are well one of the things that came out today is that th there's some pieces that are going to be added along the way so some information has come out but not all of it so that was one of the reasons why I got that additional email saying we'll continue to keep you updated here so because I would like to get that on as quickly as we uh, can yeah, next yeah. Agenda if we can. yeah okay. I, I thought you would, we would probably <laughs> think that way thank you um, you had mentioned the, the winter concerts. Um, th they were awesome, <laughs> right across the district. I, I was in a, in a winter concert in every community um, this, this uh, last uh, December season, and they, they were great. The talent that of our kids, whether it's the choral, whether it's the band, it was just, it was phenomenal. If you get a chance to get out to one of your concerts, you really need to make sure that you go and see that. Um, I had two additional, just for a really quick thing, is the pre-K, I just want to allude to that. Um, I'm so
so appreciative and so respectful of the number of parents. Um, by our account, there were 60 some um, parents that were out at the pre-K meeting on December 20th. And it was a cool night, and I know that you've got other things to do other than come and sit in an auditorium and, and listen to your administrator speak, but I'm very appreciative of the fact that so many of you were there, so I want to thank you so much for that. Um, the other thing you probably, uh, everybody in this room probably already knows, but I want to put it out for our community just to say that we have closed schools for tomorrow. Uh, you probably should have all gotten the, the text or the phone call or whatnot earlier today. Um, to me, it seemed to be a no-brainer, to, to be honest with you, for Thursday. It's Friday that we're kind of sitting on. We'll wait and see what happens tomorrow. Hopefully, I can make a decision either tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow evening. I suspect I won't be surprised if we don't have a delayed start Friday morning. Uh, but it depends on, on the strength of that storm. And, and uh, Rob and I were met earlier today, and if they, if they can't, if, if our DPWs feel that they can't get it cleared up in time, then we won't be able to have school on Friday. So we, we're just going to have to wait and play this out tomorrow and make a decision uh, tomorrow night. For the school committee purpose, um, just so that you know, we've met with our DPWs. Actually, we had that meeting just early December, I think, and brought all of our DPW leads in. Uh, you'll recall that we did that last year as well. We took a look at our process last year and said, you know, is there anything that we want to tweak here? And did we did we nail it out of the park? How did it work for all of us? And everybody unanimously said what we did last year worked perfectly. So we, we didn't make any changes to our process. Um, for the, the folks in the room, just to kind of review how the process works. Um, generally, the superintendents in our area, the local superintendents, all started an email chain. Um, I asked for it to start last night, and they did, uh, because we already saw what was coming. Um, thereafter, you're, you're, you're linking back up with your super, local superintendents. You're reaching out to your DPWs, your, your head of facilities, who is Rob Frieswick. All, all of those players uh, come to the table, and everybody's got different um, information that they bring, different maps. We kind of look at all the different maps so we can see where, and of course the storm could still, who knows what it could do between tonight and tomorrow. You, it's a, the best guess you could possibly make, you know, <coughs> and that, that's how you deal with that. Um, I, wanted, I, I knew this morning that we were probably going to close, but I wanted to wait and see. Uh, I know that Mayor uh, Walsh had a, a press conference today. Very good, and I watched uh, Governor Baker at his press conference as well. So I felt very comfortable when I knew that I was going to send the message out at 3 o'clock. And I just remember as a parent how important it was for me to get that message the night before if I could get it. So um, that's kind of, it's, a, it's not just Brooke in the back room saying, gee, I wonder if I should go to school or not. There are a lot of people involved in it. Uh, so that's that's it. So hang tight. We'll see tomorrow afternoon what we are going to do about Friday. And that's it for me. All right. Uh, we are going to move into um, Pat Maroney, our interim business manager. Um, she's going to talk to us about the FY18 budget review, FY19 budget update, and then Rob, um, we're going to move facilities update right after that. Nice, nice little uh, bundle. Okay. <coughs> Good evening <laughs> and Happy New Year. Um, I just want to bring November's financial operation statement up before you. Um, as you can see, we're moving right along. We're still waiting for um, the statement that would have the ratification of the contract. So you'll be seeing that in December. So my numbers <coughs> will look a little bit different. At that point, I'm going to request some transfers in the salary lines, and then everything will look more like it should. <coughs> um, I want, I want to make sure that, if, Pat, let's, before you go on from there, let's just make sure, because you've got a broader audience tonight, so I want to make mm -hmm. sure that there's that understanding there. I mean, your school committee is going to understand, but I don't know if the broader sure. audience is going to understand that. So, so basically, um, when we go through contract negotiations, we have to take what we anticipate an increase in the salaries is going to be and put it someplace in the budget where it's, you know, not as apparent as it normally would be. And, uh, but it has to be part of our budget because we need the funds in, in the upcoming year. So basically, um, we place it in different places in, across the budget and we have to wait for the contract to be ratified. We know the percentage salary increases and everything. 
and then once we've made those changes, which would be in December, you will then see that the salaries are in alignment and they look like there's some deficit projected numbers there when in fact they're really not. Right on. It's basically, um, you know, as, as each month goes by, the operations look a little bit different because, because of where the money is. And you'll be seeing some changes, like I said, in December. Does anybody have any questions about that? No? No? Okay, so I have an, um, I'll move on for an update about the fiscal year 19 budget. Um, I'm going to a meeting on the 11th of January. I should be getting some concrete numbers for the Worcester County um, retirement <coughs> assessment, which is a big piece you know, close to a million dollars, so um, I'm waiting for that number to come in. And we're still waiting for the state numbers. They're trickling in, getting a little bit at a time. So most of what I put into the um, original budget that I brought before you about a month ago, um, most of the numbers are right on target anyway, based on calculations that I did. But, you know, we still have some numbers that we're waiting for, and I will update that all of that information as I have it for our 20th meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I'd like to um, bring Rob to the table <coughs> at this point. Um, he will be giving us an update on uh, what's going on across <coughs> the district in facilities. Um, and if you can, oops, Rob, please work. Thanks yep. for having me. Keep, um, keep in mind, Rob is Brad Rel for again for the group. Rel Rob is. What? So many weeks on the job. Six, six, Thank six, you. Six weeks. six weeks on the job. So, I mean, he's really, he's not new to our district, but he is new to this role. And so tonight he's kind of just providing an update saying, okay, since I kind of got in here, here's where we're at right now. And then, of course, we'll, we'll talk some different things on the 20th when we talk budget. And then you'll come back probably around March or April and give a, a full fledged. By that point in time, the snow should be gone. We'll know how much damage was done to our budget with mm -hmm. snow removal and everything else. So this is just kind of a brief overview. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> um, obviously, we just went through some extreme cold temperatures with a little bit of a reprieve today. Um, Jim Brigham, the electrician, HVAC tech, uh, general, you know, all around handyman. Uh, it's been working around the clock to monitor and fix any eating issues um, that have been coming up. Um, we've been proactive in keeping the nighttime set points up at night, you know, to avoid any frozen pipes um, because it's just it's bad news, you know, anytime we have anything like that. Um, fuel consumption is going to be up, obviously, in December because of the cold temps and the nighttime set temps being up at nighttime. Um, you know, after this weekend, it looks like the long, you know, long range temperature models are going to come up a little bit. So hopefully, we can get a little reprieve on the heating systems. Um, we had a couple of snow, you know, snow and ice events under our belts. Um, you know, we had excellent communications with the DPW directors, um, and you know, a couple of things we need to iron out with our, you know, internal plow contractors. But overall, I think we did pretty good. Um, obviously, tomorrow is going to be a big one, so you know, a pretty big telltale sign. Um, quick update on the Sawyer uh, Sawyer boiler project um, from you know, converting from oil to propane. Um, Mike McLaughlin from Alanco came in yesterday. They were hoping to switch from the boiler unit that we're currently using right now to the secondary unit in order to make the conversion to propane um, and put the new boiler unit in, but they found some issues with that secondary boiler, so we kind of put things on hold right now. We don't want to go forward, you know, and have any issues in these cold temperatures and lose the heating system, so. Um, we just delayed it. We delayed it. So until you know, this cold snap is yeah, done. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking maybe we'll wait till February vacation when the school is empty and gives us a little more flexibility there. So, um, carpet installation at the center school. Uh, the bus entrance went in over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, things it looks well great. There. Yeah, it came out good. Um, Jim Brigham is working with National Grid on a VFD program uh, for the schools in Bolton and Lancaster, variable drive fre uh, frequency drives. Um, this program is a no-cost program. Um, ICS contracting is adding VFDs to our heating uh, and cooling units. Um, it, it will give us significant cost savings once these are all up and running. Um, under normal operating conditions, like I said, we'll see significant savings. Um, I just have some quick numbers here. Um, for Sawyer School, you know, we can see a one-year savings of $9,000, potentially $9,000. There's a lot of variables that go into that. Um, 
Emerson School. Oh, this School. is a result, excuse me, I'm sorry. It's okay. As a result of converting to? to putting these VFDs in, because what oh. happened right now is when the system calls for heat <laughs> or it calls for HVAC, it just goes from zero to 100. There's nothing in between. So if Got you're it. only running half the building, it'll, you know, it'll regulate, regulate it. it so it's not running full tilt all the time. Thank you. Um, Emerson, we're looking at, um, you know, just over $2,500 a year. The high school, um, right, right around $10,000. Um, MRE and LBMS, we're looking uh, about $12,000 um, a year in savings, um, potential savings, if things. These, these numbers are based on like eight hours runtime uh, <coughs> and also uh, eight cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so right now we're locked into that price. So, you know, that's, that's a good hard number. Um, I'm filling out an application with Hudson Light and Power right now because um, that's who we buy our power from down there. So National Grid, you know, they're not servicing those schools, so they're not part of this program. Hudson Light Power does offer uh, incentive programs for VFDs and also LED lighting. So once we go forward with that, uh, there'll be an energy audit, and then we'll see, you know, what we're eligible for. Um, and like Superintendent Clenchy, you know, alluded to earlier, was the deep cleaning at the high school. Um, we had a company, Resource One, come <coughs> in over the break um, to do a thorough cleaning of the athletic areas um, at, the, at the high school. Uh, three locker rooms, bathrooms that are in those, uh, the two gyms, the cage inside the upper gym, um, the trainer's room, some of the hallways that the student athletes use for stretching out and various other things. Um, the gym cleaning consisted of wiping down the walls. Um, they had mops basically that they would put in a cleaning and disinfecting solution and they were going up I would say probably about 12 feet high and wiping from that point down to the floor. Um, all, the, all the walls were wiped down, all the protective padding, bleachers, chairs, um, and the floors were also disinfected and cleaned with solution. Um, so, so I'm going to interrupt you again. Sorry, that's something that I've heard from several people so thank you for jumping on that. When was the last time the gym and the locker rooms because the the, the 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 locker rooms especially the boys locker room has been a concern for many many years when was the last time it was done the, i mean it's always it's cleaned every day um no regular clean but we're just oh, regular cleaning clean. no, we're talking the deep i want to know like about this kind of cleaning sitting here six weeks i'm not sure mm -hmm. um i i know that it's they have disinfectant solutions. You can be honest use. and tell me it hasn't been done in 10 years if it hasn't been done in 10 years. <laughs> I would, that would if I had that information, I would hearing. give it to you. <laughs> okay. But I don't, I don't have that information. The bottom line is we don't have any evidence that it has been done in probably at least a decade. Okay. So we've got no records that show that it has been done. So now that it's been done, are we going to get on a, a rotating schedule? Yep, to we're kind of shifting our mindset on how we clean and, and there's other products and other uh, pieces of equipment that we're going to put into use on a more regular basis. Um, there's, uh, let me just go back to other things that were done during this cleaning. Um, in the locker rooms, all the lockers were cleaned out before um, students went home um, and the lockers were cleaned inside, out, all around, um, floors, showers, bathroom areas. Um, all sporting equipment was fogged with a fogger with a disinfectant. Basketballs, volleyballs, anything that were inside the closets in the lower <coughs> gym. Um, you psyched? Oh yeah, <laughs> I watched the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> we're adding more hand sanitizing stations around the high school. Um, they, Jason, the head custodian, has put a bunch up. We're waiting for the rest of them to come in. Once they come in, we'll have those installed. Uh, we're adding signage to the bathrooms, you know, explaining the importance of proper hand washing. Um, and we're adding <coughs> sanitizing wipes inside the cage area where they do a lot of the workouts. So that way the athletes, coaches, uh, any staff members, they can wipe down the equipment after they're done using it. Right. Um, going forward, uh, you know, we like to take this approach into all locker room and gym areas at the middle schools, you know, and all the other schools to make sure that everything is, you know, good across the district. Um, we have a fogging machine um, that we're going to put into rotation uh, probably once a week inside these high traffic areas uh, where you know the basketballs and the volleyballs are stored the weight cage and you just go through and you just you put the solution over it and it just disinfects you know anything that the fog comes in touch with so um, you know hopefully any issues you know Have we always had that or is that something no that they've had it for maybe a couple of years or so um, they, uh, they've used it five years. Oh, they've had it that long 
Um, I know they use it, uh, you know, if there's a flu outbreak or you know, something like that, they'll go through in a classroom and they'll, you know, they'll just hit the whole classroom. So we think it's a really good idea to put it in a rotation at the high school. That's a great idea. Hit all those other areas, so the gyms and the locker rooms. So. Thank you. This is a huge step forward for us. Like I, I'm, I'm really, really pleased that we did this, and I'm really pleased about taking it to the next step now and going after the middle schools and those areas and, and whatnot. So um, I th you, you both did a great job on this. Thank you. I know that you um, met with a lot of different people and, and before you decided who you wanted to work with and such, and, and I'm really excited about moving forward with this. So thanks for doing that. Can I ask you a question? Look, you said that um, there's no record, so we have records? <coughs> Oh my God! No, there. Uh, no, I, was I thought we found some. I was just. I was no, say. no, we didn't find any. <laughs> I thought you found some. No, we did not find uh, any. Records, we will no. going forward though. It's okay. But you know what, Rob? Uh, uh, thank you for saying that because uh, you're you're new to this and you see that we have now got records, yeah. right? And yes. that's file cabinet full of them. File cabinets <laughs> with with stuff in it, and it's just <coughs> yeah. I'm really proud of the work that we've done in these areas to rebuild files. Thank you. Thanks. Does anybody else have questions for Rob? I just wanted to add um, one other thing too. Um, Whitewater will be here mm. um, at the next meeting to go over um, a, a capital the capital item that we have um, proposed in the budget um, for um, the high the school. Upgrade, up, the updating of the wastewater at the high school. Really so. Day from out of the engineering, um, the engineer that's working on that's going to be here as well. So. And this is the <coughs> this is the hundred and fifty thousand dollar plus project that we're looking at that we have to do. We are out of compliance, and we're on the, the EPA naughty list. <laughs> no one else to say. It. Like we are out of compliance. We have to do something September here. First deadline. We have to be in compliance. So does the rest of the school committee understand what that out of compliance is a result of? Because I think it's important for you guys to understand it's. Um, it's not that things weren't taken care of. It's that there was some new regulation, <coughs> from what I remember, mm -hmm. that was implemented. Mm -hmm. And because of that new regulation, our existing wastewater treatment facility, whatever you call it, they they reduced the number. I'm going go, let me let me give it a shot because I got to get this stuff straight. <laughs> this is what I do at night, right? When I'm alone. Um, the 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 distance from our treatment facility to surrounding wells. Mm -hmm. was in compliance mm -hmm. and then the regulations changed and it shrunk those regulations right. and there was no grandfathering right we don't have that option to say but we were here first right so that's why we have to take care of this right. just want to make sure everybody understood that yeah. okay are we good, good. We're good. thank you thank, thank you, you very much <laughs> okay we're going to jump into new business uh, why don't we do the um, the endowment, let's do the endowment fund and, oh, yeah, the, and the, um, <laughs> the Luther Burbank acceptance first, and then we'll jump back up. So we'll need Pat for that. Jump back again. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a letter here from the endowment fund, and um, basically what the endowment fund is, is a, um, a fund is of several members from the community. Um, I have the letter, the letter is posted on the website, but basically what they do is they look at the, um, additional um, needs of the high school in particular and um, teachers are encouraged to put in requests for any additional need that they may have and then the endowment fund makes a decision as to whether or not they are going to fund this particular <coughs> request and they have um, approved $1989.90 um, in What's made up of this particular amount is um, there's some science, science and wellness, world language, supplies. Um, one of them, there's a game, um, supplies to start a cooking club, German Im immersion supplies, some additional headphones, and some cork boards. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, they have made these funds available <coughs> to us again for <coughs> the high school. So I need you to accept this. So I need a motion. Mark, you want to? <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Um, I move that we accept the uh, proposed grants from the Neshoba um, Endowment Fund for the purpose of um, <coughs> as described in their um, mm -hmm. letter of memorandum in our agenda for the amount of 1989 and 90 cents. 
Thank you. And a second. So moved. I have a second. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, all those in favor? It's unanimous. And I think it's only fair because this endowment fund does this kind of work for the school every single year to recognize the people that are on the endowment fund. Mm -hmm. Paula Kastner, yes. Audrey McLean, Amy Ferris, Rita French, Karen Fox, Audrey Gamon, Raksha Patel, Valerie Parent, and Sarah Wegner. Thank you all very, very much. Okay. And the Luther Burbank, Washington, D.C. donation. Right. Um, I have a letter here from the principal, Laura Friend, at the um, Luther Burbank Middle School, and she is asking us to accept a donation, a gift donation, on behalf of the Luther Bur Burbank Middle School in the amount of $4,500, <coughs> and this is to defray the cost of the 8th grade Washington, D.C. trip, which will occur May 29th through June 1st, 2018. Um, specifically, this gift is intended to pay for the cost of the trip for five students and their families who have requested financial assistance for the trip. The, um, the gift was generously offered by a parent benefactor who wishes to remain anonymous. So, I motion. Mark, would you please? I move that the school committee accept on behalf of the district um, the proposed uh, gift of $4,500 for Luther Burbank Middle School um, travel to Washington, D.C. second? Second. Steve, all those in favor? It's unanimous. And um, I think we all need to do a, a very loud thank you to whoever this parent benefactor is um, for this incredible, generous, thoughtful gift. Okay. Next is the um, <coughs> kindergarten <coughs> program update. So I'm going to turn it over to the superintendent. Sure, and I'll move out of the way. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to uh, ask our elementary principals to come forward. Um, Cindy Maxfield is here. She'll join us. And Joan DeAngelis is the back there. And she will join the, the table as well. Thank you, Chair. so much. Um, so I'm going to actually over to the principals. I know that we've got a, a PowerPoint here. Um, Alita's probably bringing it up um, as I speak. Um, I, I think we, we came forward to uh, the school committee last year and we had uh, requested that we make a couple of different changes. We wanted to see how those changes to the program went this year. And so far, I, I think it would be safe to say that we, we are feeling very comfortable right now with where things are at. You'll also recall that this was the group that we decided that we would add some additional um, talent to the team this year. And uh, when we saw the numbers come in, that's one of the, the strengths of having that um, wiggle room to add more stuff if we need to or, or not. And in this case, we sat down and said, even though the budget had already passed at that point in time, we looked at it and we said, you know what, this, this would be so much better if we could add some additional staff to the mm -hmm. roster. And so we did that and, and, um, and it worked out really, really well in each of our communities. So I'm going to have the principals speak to all of that and then um, it will also speak to, as we're moving forward, what our thinking is. So just again, I know that the community probably knows everyone, but let me just have them raise their hands. So the far side there is Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Maxfield. Uh, she's our early education uh, coordinator. Uh, Sean O'Shea is your principal in Lancaster. Ross Mulcairn is your principal at Stowe at Center. And Joel Bates <coughs> is your principal here um, at Florence Sawyer and Emerson. And Joan DeAngelis is sitting back in the back. Joan is our director of pupil and um, personnel services and <coughs> she also helps to oversee or well, pretty much oversees completely all of our SPED uh, programming and uh, requirements and keeps us in line uh, with regards to statutes and regulations that we need to be abiding by a and everything whether it's pre-k k special education k-12 she is our go-to person for that 
Uh, so with all of that said then, gentlemen, I'll, I'll turn it over to you folks to start. And Ross, I think you're going to tee this up. Yes. Uh, so thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, just real quick, the discussion points are up on uh, the screen, but you have them as part of your packet as of, the, well, the Friday before, I think, the, the last meeting, because this was postponed. Um, so historical enrollment data will be reviewed by Cynthia. Um, Joel's going to talk a little bit about data from our current application, and Sean will uh, talk about the proposed recommendations. And then I'll wrap it up with proposed timeline, and we feel like if there's questions at the end of each slide, please ask them or we can answer questions at the end from the school committee. Well, it might make better sense to go through everything and save the yep. questions from and the school committee. We can go back to the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here we have the kindergarten enrollment data from the past three years. And I think the numbers speak for themselves. These are what our numbers were the past three years. Um, at all three schools in half day or full day. <coughs> the hybrid model was started in 1415 actually. So we had the hybrid model for three years. This year we went to the um, designated half day classroom, designated full day <coughs> classrooms. And those are our numbers. So thank you, Cindy. The, um, so the current numbers are, um, you've had them for a couple of weeks. They've changed a little bit, and I'll ask my colleagues to sort of give you an update on, on some of those. Uh, it's, and I think even, even now, on January 3rd, um, there's a lot that's still in flux. That, uh, you know, for example, at Florence Sawyer, there are 64 uh, fam 64 students that we're looking at. Uh, we have more than the nine half day. We, we still have not heard from 17 of those families in terms of what they're looking at for fuller half day. So those numbers are not quite, uh, they're not quite solid yet. So I can speak for center. Uh, we are much closer to what our census number was. Uh, some of the families that came off the census, either they moved um, or uh, they won't be attending center school for various reasons, whether it's private school, home school. Other families have come on that they've either moved in or just weren't part of the census to begin with for whatever reason, they were overlooked. Um, so currently we are at, a, we are at 69 uh, families responding regarding their students. So that's a total, we have, right now we have a total of 60 full day requests and nine half day requests. So, and they're still coming in. And even during, uh, we met this afternoon just to go over some numbers real quick and just in preparation for this evening. And as I was in the meeting, Mary O'Brien sent me an email from our office to say another full day request to come in. So they're still coming in, um, but we're getting closer to what our census number is. Um, yeah, so we're slow starters, but we strong, we <laughs> have a strong um, um, So <coughs> there were 52 on the census. We know that two students moved, but two students moved in. So um, 52 have gone out. We currently have uh, 26 students committed to the full day and seven to the half day. So we're still waiting on 17 responses. Keep in mind though, um, MRE adds uh, on average about 40 students a year over the last three years. So uh, last year we started at about uh, 50 and we ended at, or we, uh, we started at 58 and we ended at 71. So um, uh, Mrs. Kerrigan <coughs> is uh, going to be making a lot of phone calls and has been making a lot of phone calls to track down those other 17 and, and get more information. So this still information to be had over the next couple and that, that's true for all of us that you know where we have outliers and we don't have preferences yet those calls will be the sort of the next phase of that those calls will be made to homes to say where do we stand are you coming what is it you know what is your choice looking like and I want to point out we, we went through this exact same thing last year too and I remember saying to the school committee even last year these numbers are in flux and they, they really do tend to fluctuate quite a bit between now and actually till school starts to be honest with you. Can you can you tell me again Joel I'm, I'm sure. sorry um, what your current and I know we're at the beginning of January and yep. we've got nine more months to go but um, can you tell me what your full and half day is right now? Uh, I, I can't tell you what the, the well I so half day is 11 okay. right now. Um, full day, I think we're up to 30, but that means that there's, you know, that number minus 
the what are you, are you talking sorry? current? No. Oh, Do you mean okay. our projected yeah. ones? You are you talking projected for yeah. next year or yeah. right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so those numbers. Yeah. Um, oh, there they are. Yeah. Okay. And and so those are, this is based on the data of twelve fourteen, that uh, you know as Ross said I think our census data is closer to where it was, uh, and what we expect it's it's around sixty four right now but we don't have preferences from 17 of our families all right and so you've got 11 half day and then would you say 30 about roughly 30 yeah, full? Yep. okay yep. that's all I needed thank you and Sean just to review you've got seven and a half day right now right mm -hmm. okay what do you guys I'm sorry I know I'm supposed to wait but I can't I have to touch <laughs> so when you folks like Typically at this point in the school year, and I know we have people move in during the summer, move out during the summer, and I know that's a big, busy, squishy time. But generally, when do things start to feel like a little more solid? March, the, the beginning of March is our typical hard registration day. Okay. Uh, where the parents are coming in, we're getting all the hard paperwork, and, and that's usually where we get the solid amount of, of what's gonna happen. So we have two months to see that, like nine and seven. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair based on what I've seen at center the last two years. I think the the fluctuations that come in and out afterwards, while they're not an exact net zero, I think they're they're not as impactful as it is up until that date. So okay, so yeah. we're going to see a lot more activity. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think you're planning on um, reporting to the school committee again on the twenty uh, on the twentieth. Twentieth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our budget uh, projections will reflect where we think we're going oh, good. to be. Great. You know, we're going to try and get that as accurate as possible. Awesome. That's helpful. Thanks. Lynn? I was just wondering, I mean, do you guys still assess the kindergartners or because that gives you a more a harder number because the parents actually come in and get assessed and do, they, do you guys? So we do kindergarten? the screening in the fall once the kids mm -hmm. start attending. Yeah. But one, we, once, I mean, by the time <coughs> we're we're through that registration process, I mean, I think we have a pretty hard number about where we're at. Yeah. I don't know fluctuation comes in and out, at least from my experience at center. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you, I mean, I've heard, but how do you feel about this current model versus the... When you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Go ahead, Sorry. So our, our recommendations uh, based on all those numbers, uh, last year we looked at this and we, we continue uh, to recommend going with the program that we have having uh, the full day uh, option and a uh, half day option for parents who would uh, choose that the non hybrid model um, as we were just talking and there's a timeline on the next uh, slide um, to monitor the enrollment to see how the impacts of those enrollments um, uh, if they jump up or down um, and make some uh, give you and us some real clear dates uh, so we can make some <coughs> good decisions on that and uh, and then lastly, our, our recommendation <coughs> is is not to change anything with the tuition at this moment. So the tuition that was this year's mm -hmm. tuition, you want to maintain that for next year. That's our recommendation. Okay, we can we can talk about all this after they finish. Okay. All right. Thank you. So just lastly, our, our timeline, obviously, we're going to continue to collaborate with, with Broken Other Central Office staff um, regarding enrollment and what things are looking like up until that January 20th workshop. So at that time, when we talk about numbers of sections for grade levels, um, you know, kindergarten is obviously part of that discussion, and we'll let the school committee know what, what we're looking for for sections uh, for the following school year relative to what we have in for enrollment data for kindergarten at that time. So, and just like we said, that March, dead, that March <coughs> timeline um, we want to make sure that we update any enrollment before then uh, <coughs> that if we're making any changes to our recommendations uh, we do so around that time um, and not any later uh, so that we can update incoming K families about what's happening and then going into April May, May and June that allows us to stay on our timeline uh, for uh, communication parent nights student visits things like that so what would what would change though I mean so I think we feel comfortable knowing what our numbers are going to look like once we have most of our applications back on, on January 20th. Um, but if things in come in with an influx or change or parents make requests to go from half day to full day or full day to half day, I think we need to be mindful that that may still happen, but we want to make sure that we're dealt with it and we're done by March 
of, of this year and not wait any longer to make any changes to recommendations by that point. Yeah. Okay. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to do it. I mean, do you want to tell parents that that's it, or do you want to? No, I don't think that that's what we're saying mm -hmm. at all, Lynn. I, I don't think that we're pro I think we're just saying we, we have to, at some point in time, we have to kind of say, what's the cutoff? How many kids, how many classes are we going to run? What is this going to look like? Mm -hmm. And we don't want to wait as long as we did last year. We want to say, look, we need to know by about March for hiring purposes or whatever it is that we're right. doing, right? And so that's all we're saying. We're not saying it's an absolute <coughs> cutoff and put it in. Get in, uh, that's not all what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Okay. I think, too, one of the concerns that we have, I want to put out uh, one or two thoughts on this, too, is just the, the half days. Like, if we continue to only have, like, let's say we've got seven kids in there right now, but two withdraw and we're left with five, then that's going to leave us in a different situation. So we may have to approach the school committee at that January 20th meeting and say, this is what we're seeing right now. We've got concerns about this. So, because then, what do you do? What do you run a class with five kids in it, or not? You know. So, uh, so we just want to leave that door kind of open that's out there. So, if that were to happen, then we would want you to come to us with a couple uh, of suggestions, your rep recommendations. And and we've mm -hmm. talked that we've mm -hmm. talked about that too. But I think right now we decided that let's just wait and see what the numbers are first, because otherwise, you so many what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. It doesn't make any sense. So we'll just wait and see what the numbers are, be thoughtful, and then right. come to you on the 20th and say, okay. here's what we're thinking. Right. And it, I think the enrollment game is not any different than it is for any of our grade levels. Mm -hmm. As we watch mm -hmm. grade levels come up or grade levels go down, and whether or not we need to have a discussion with central office with regards to the number of sections we have at that grade level, I think that's something that we continually watch. What's different with kindergarten is that we need to make sure that we're identifying mm -hmm. this to make sure that we're on a timeline to notify families this is what we're doing. This is the yeah. model we're running with. So you're not. We don't even want to play what if scenarios <coughs> now. No. no, it's way too early <laughs> too. <laughs> premature. Yeah. No what ifs. Sorry. No, <laughs> not right now. Would, well, it wouldn't make any sense. Right. You don't have the numbers yet. I get it. Um, the only other thing that I would I would put forward, and we've had lots of discussion on this, and we're not prepared to come to you uh, with any type of recommendation right now. Um, is the notion of a uh, free full day came? What does that look like? What does that cost? What, you know, and and I want to be um, uh, cautious when we talk about this because I think you know as we even talk more about it again today. But it, and these discussions have, by the way, have been ongoing for us since last year. This is not something, gee, we just started talking about today. These discussions have been ongoing, <coughs> and I think you know it, there's there's going to at some point in time we're going to have to look because i think that people think free full day and that word free is out there and they don't realize that there's another piece behind it, it the, that it's it's actually not free and we uh, we as a school district or as the three communities are going to have to decide are you going to want to pony up the money that it's going to take to offer free full day k and we've talked to a number of superintendents. Uh, a couple of us have been on different phone calls uh, in the room, and we put them on spe speaker <laughs> phone, and we all huddle <coughs> around the phone. And, and so we can ask a lot of really intense questions. And, and uh, one of the things, of course, that continues to come up, and, and uh, it goes back to referencing things like that $60,000 grant that went away last year, is what happens when that happens? Because how is this sustainable? And you know, uh, uh, when you talk to the superintendents, that's uh, because nobody wants to offer it and then have to pull <coughs> it back. And it's not, it is not fed fully by our state government. And I don't think that there's an understanding of that or how the foundation budget works. And so those are all mitigating factors in this. It's a very complex piece. Um, there are some communities that are looking at the potential of phasing it in or ramping it and we've had that discussion too. I know that we've brought up before that we've also looked at the Concord model and said is that something we want to take a look at. Um, you know, but we continue to say we want to be thoughtful and we want, we want to understand where is that money going to come from because we've had that discussion as well. Where will the cuts come across the district? that will have to be made to fund uh, that program because that's the only way we, we would be able to run it. So we've had all kinds of discussions. It, it's not grant money that you apply <laughs> for and get. It, that's not at all how it works. It works just the same way as our October 1st student count works. 
And so it, it's not something that's just out there that you just make application for and it just funnels in. That's not at all how it works. So we want to take our time with this and be thoughtful and and the school committee at some point in time we're going to have to have some really rich discussion on no, do you want us to really pursue this or not? I, I'm not sure where we where you stand on it, where we stand on it. So I just want to put it out there. It's not that we have, we're not doing work on it. We're doing a lot of work behind the scenes on it. But it, it's it's a fair chunk of money, and we're going to have to have some really hard discussion on so it. So when 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 that discussion comes forward to the school committee with your recommendation, I would want to hear from the principals what you're the you own your community. Right. What are you hearing in your community? I know that we've heard from a, a small, recent, respectable group of people who are very passionate about it, but I want to know what you're hearing from other people in your schools. I, I, well, I, would, I, I, I mean, I would say on, on one hand, um, when we discussed this uh, at some time in the past and it continues to come up, there's a rich handful or two of people who value half-day uh, mm -hmm. kindergarten uh, and are very passionate and, uh, and argue for it. And I came from a district where they had full day for like eight or nine years. I knew nothing different until I came here. Mm -hmm. And so to hear another side and why people were very passionate about it, um, I really respected that and, and, and one of the reasons we moved to this model. So, and there, there continues to be that and there is, um, you know, compelling argument for some children to be in school all day at that age, too. Yeah, I, you know, as a principal, I, I understand the argument and I understand uh, the point for our community as as a parent. You know, my, my son was born at the end of May. I, we would have loved to have had the option of half day and it wasn't an option for us. Uh, and I think he's, you know, he's, he's done as well. Anyone that knows my son knows that. <laughs> uh, but but I think that you know it it we get survey data, we get anecdotal data, we have conversations, and and I think this is the the uh, and thank you for bringing up the studies who made the comment that you know there is an aspect I think to this particular school district where we want to be responsive to what our community wants as well, and and I think. You know, when we look at the model that we advocated to move toward this year uh, and that we're advocating to continue, it was supported not just by um, our parents, but also our teacher, our kindergarten teachers and the kindergarten aides. And, and for reasons that, you know, are, are not just about logistics. It, they are about the sense of community that kids have in a half-day classroom that they don't necessarily get, or when parents don't feel that they necessarily get in, uh, you know, leaving um, during the day. Uh, and that was a strong motivator for us. And, and um, so, uh, you know, I think <laughs> as we continue to get more information about what uh, those numbers are going to look like, I, you know, we'll continue to do what we do, and we, we talk all the time, um, you know, to be as calibrated as we can in terms of a recommendation uh, to the superintendent, to, to you, to, to act on in terms of your support and advocacy for that programming, and, and, and that's, those are, those are curriculum and instruction and programming issues that are not necessarily, you know, uh, you know that are separate from the, the financial discussions. And, um, uh, you know, I, this is a model that, that we've wanted to move back toward for a while. And, and uh, um, it, it's a model that I think, you know, we're continuing to see success with. Okay, great. Ross, did you have any questions? <coughs> I, I mean, I would, would obviously support what was just said. I think also, too, looking at feedback from parents now that their cho their children are in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever it may be, grade to say, you know, what was your experience with half day versus full day? You know, would you do the same thing again? That type of thing. If, if we were looking at making a decision about, you know, not having a half day option, I'd want to know what, now that families are in the mix of upper elementary, middle school even, what are their feelings about having a done half day versus full day? I'd want to have some of that information as well. And I would say out of my office, I get mixed 
mixed reaction. I mean, I certainly, uh, I think, Sean, you alluded to, you know, the pa people that feel very passionate about uh, a free full day K experience, but then there's also others that feel very passionately against it. And so our job is to try to, to juggle it all. Now, Cindy, Cindy, I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add or not. No, in the same way, um, with the two models, the hybrid as opposed to the um, single half day, that you have mixed reviews on that, too. That's what I have found. But it's working right now, so. We're yeah, I feel like I, I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with this than that. Yeah. I don't, I didn't, I'm sorry. Yeah, well. And I'm not an educator, I, right? So I, what do I know? I'm a parent. And, you know, I have the same um, pros and cons. There, there are pros and cons. And um, that what, what we have now is working. And I think, I, I don't think we have anyone opposed to it. Uh, I don't think any of the parents are. Are opposed to it in either <coughs> either of the sections they might be in. So, why fix something that's not broken? <laughs> okay. That's it. So I'm going to ask. I'm going to open this up because I know the school committee has some comments, questions on this. So why don't we, um, Steve? Do you have something you'd like to share? Well, I I did mention to you prior. To that's the why meeting, I asked. <laughs> um, that I think we should be working way to that but there are there are some things I need to know first for example what does it cost us and is it revenue neutral as it exists now and number and we're losing money as it is now um, what would it what would free K cost us and how would we pay for it and would the towns be willing to accept <coughs> that as part of our budget or Will we find resistance in the towns? And, um, and all credit to all the parents in here and who have made their comments known to both us on the school committee and to Brooke uh, over the last month at least. Um, they're not the full town. And we have to be cognizant of the other issues that all three <coughs> of the town, towns have on a, from a financial point of view. And that's, I mean, from an educational point of view, I have no problem with it. It, we should be doing it. From a financial point of view, it becomes another issue. And how we do it, and if we do it in a step method or a uh, graduated method, uh, I, I think Littleton is one of the towns that's doing it over a five-year period. We have to see how that is, because all of, all of these, the, the parents who are now have kids going into this, into the K program, if we do this on a step basis, they'll be out of that out of the K issue very very quickly and and, and then look be looking at other funding demands for the schools as as the kids go through them, which is just as valid. So one of the just things that valid. I want to so know look at before we even talk about the dollars is and I and I've heard and I've done my own research and I get it. Um, and I forget who was the parent she left. She left. It's from Stowe, right? Yeah. yeah Joel. Who talked about Philadelphia. Like, to me, I think studies are great, but you've got to compare uh -huh. the demographic to the mm -hmm. demographic. So, and I will take a look at that study, because Philadelphia demographic is very different to a low income in, Phil in the Philadelphia city, right, the city of Philadelphia, than there is here. So I could, and what I've seen is that um, that, that really benefits um, a demographic that doesn't reflect ours. Does that mean it's not going to work for us? No, I'm not saying that, but I want to see data from you guys that <coughs> says, yes, this is not because everybody's doing it, we should do it because everybody's doing it, because what I'm hearing and what I've heard from you, Brooke, is that some of these districts are like, we don't know how we're going to do this. Now we're in it, we don't know what we're going to do and what we're going to cut. I don't want to look at the dollars until <coughs> I understand the fit for our communities. That's really what I want to understand. Um, Kathy, Lynn, Elise, Susan, Mark, any other? Susan, Kathy, sorry. Kathy. Whatever your name is. <laughs> no, I think that it's um, working toward um, full day K, I think is um, something that we need to be talking about. I agree about the funding 
there are some funding challenges this year. And um, I think that they are exacerbated perhaps by changes to um, the way we pay taxes or so. And what the towns, Steve made the point about the towns, I, I agree with that. But I think that when you start to look at things programmatically, you look at what has value, you do the same thing, K-12. So this is no exception to that. Um, there are a lot of models of full day K, not necessarily, you mentioned Cochran. Cochran has three full days, two half days. One of the half days, the teachers use for their prep time and working together. The other half day, they create groups of kids to bring in for enrichment, mm -hmm. or if kids need extra help with reading, numeracy, anything like that. Um, and that was a, a battle to get it to that model. The other thing that I observed and that we might anticipate is whatever we decide, there are going to be people who don't want to do it that way. <laughs> I, you know, I only want my kid to go for a day. I think we have to anticipate that. The other thing is that while schools are required to offer kindergarten, um, kindergarten attendance is not compulsory. You don't have to go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there are a lot of things that we need to understand about it. Um, but it's, it's, um, I think it's a worthwhile pursuit to look at it programmatically. Um, but we have to look at the, the, the juggling act that we have to do with our budget and see what the realities are about what it's going to mean for people's taxes, given all the changes that are coming forward. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not an easy thing, but it doesn't mean we don't do it just because it's taxes. Anything else? Anyone? There's a ton of ways to look at all this information. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of studies, there's a lot of angles, and there's a lot of work here. Yep. You really work it up. Yes, job. she does. <laughs> <laughs> Are we Pardon? Are we directing her? Are we no. directing her? No. <laughs> She's got to come forward with a recommendation. You're not the educator, and neither am I, and I don't want that responsibility. I just want to assess okay. her work. <laughs> All right. Um, so, if your recommendation is to leave it as is for the FY19 school year. Mm -hmm. And then on the 20th, you're going to come back and give us an update. Yeah. And then the tuition rates at that point, <coughs> the tuition rates have been put out there. And your recommendation was to keep the tuition rates. Did I hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No change. Part of their recommendation. Yeah, 72. I got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So so their recommendation is to keep it the way it is and keep the tuition the way it is. For the FY, FY19. But that might change in, in March. My God, if you guys want to, I should have said that, but mm -hmm. if you guys want to touch that tuition rate, you better do it soon. Well, no, I'm, I'm just asking because... No, we weren't recommending looking at tuition. They don't want to touch no. the tuition. No, what we were talking no, you're, about is looking you're recommending at the rec Tonight, you're mm -hmm. recommending that it stay the same mm -hmm. and the tuition stay the same. Mm -hmm. the, the class model and the tuition. But things could change on in March. Just yes. in, in terms of the numbers just in March. Just, 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 just what we might be looking at. Yeah. Just on numbers only. Okay. Yeah, right. that's all. Not the beyond, model. Beyond tonight, we're just not making any recommendations. Just population. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, just, I just feel the need to say that I'm not possible asking on any recommendations until we have the whole budget big picture. Right. We have um, mm -hmm. some information that's going to be presented about user fees. There are other things. We also got the message last month that there's $800,000 that we used to get that we're not going to get anymore. I think there's a lot of looking well, at we're not, we're not, we're not. I just want to make sure that we're not. For me, no, I, I, I think we've it. talked about, what is this? What's this, the article she sent? Oh. Oh, that's I, all that is. Okay, so we shouldn't be reading that right now. We should be focusing on what we're doing here. Um, I think a couple months ago, the purpose of all these folks coming forward and all of Brooks functional areas coming forward in addition to the principals was for us to get an overview of what's happening in those areas, not to make any decisions. Because we can't make any decisions without looking at the big picture. Right. The whole so, thing. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. No. No. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. 
Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Four of you. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Old business. Athletic fees. Athletic fees. Okay, Tanya. Seriously, I was blown away. So I have no life. I sold my Patriots tickets. You know. For the <laughs> January first game. And I looked at the packet while I was sitting in my warm living room, and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at how much stuff Tanya did. So I texted her, and she was at the game. Yeah. <laughs> Freezing. Freezing, yeah. Freezing, you foolish girl. Yeah. I wish uh, that's yeah. very warm. Yes. Lots of layers. Yes. <laughs> so why don't we turn it over to you, and hear, let's hear what you have to say. So you'll recall that Tanya came uh, a couple months ago, about two months ago, to talk about uh, athletic user fees. That was one of the areas that you had asked us to take another look at. Amongst other, other programs you'd asked us to look at, athletic user fees was also one of those. And so you had, had a couple of questions and you kind of sent her on her way to do some research for you and bring that information back. Tonight she's here bringing that information back. So why don't you take it from there, Tanya? Okay. So. Um Okay, so I took what you asked for the last meeting and I kind of added to the large spreadsheet. Um, <coughs> included, you know, I worked off FY17 numbers, so I went back. And again, a lot of these are approximate numbers. Um, I didn't go, you know, to the sense of every little thing, um, but I did round up so they were, you know, easier numbers to work with. And I also added some information on gate receipts collected, so I thought that was kind of an important thing to see on what sports and what different games bring in money for us. Yeah. Um, to kind of add into the large spreadsheet. And then on top of the, the user fee data, I added some other schools, um, just other area high schools and what their user fees are um, and any additional fees and family caps that they have. So one of the things that you had proposed last time you were with <coughs> us was a $900 family cap. Yep. Um, and there were a couple of other things. So we're not going to do any voting on this. I just want you guys to remember that, well, I want you to remember when you come before us on the 20th to remind us. So anything that your folks have come to us with that they need a vote on or a decision on, to remind us on the 20th, okay? Because yep. I just I, right now we're just trying to drink from the fire hose. Um, but uh, I'm 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 digging the data. Like I don't think we've ever had this much, much data and yeah. such rich data. So wh whatever it took you and however <laughs> much time, I appreciate it. Um, and please thank the principals. Their presentation was exactly what we want. Like short, succinct. Know. Yeah, not All a lot of black. Okay. Um, so Tanya. Um, is there anything you want to point out to us, or can I entertain questions from the group? You can ask questions. Yep. Mark, I'm <laughs> sure you have a question or two. <laughs> I've worked with you for three years. Come on. <laughs> if you don't, we'll move on. Um, I don't have immediate questions. I, I think it's great that you've compiled all of this. It's very helpful to get some perspective from individually of the sports as well as mm -hmm. um, the activities of the sports as well. I really appreciate it. I'm sure it's no small effort to dig up um, some of this and put it into one comprehensive page. Thank you. You're welcome. Kath. Um, again, thank you. Very comprehensive. <coughs> uh, thank God for spreadsheets. Huh? <laughs> Love them. <laughs> um, the other thing you did, which I really appreciate, is the 10-year compilation of the what the district has I'll put in the, and I'm assuming that this is what it is from the general fund, the athletic line item. Yes. Pat did that report for oh, us. Okay. I can't take credit for that. I'll <laughs> give you credit okay. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but Poor so <laughs> according to this, we put, um, we have put um, last year or um, for FY 16 and 17, about $600,000 from the, the general fund has gone towards athletics. <coughs> and that does not include or is not offset by any of the user fees or anything, or is it? Actually, um, there, if you look at the bottom part under the 600, those are the expenditures by the revolving funds. Okay. See so the bottom half? Yes. So we <coughs> look at that athletic budget yep. as a whole. I see. So the two hundred and fifty-two thousand right. dollars are things that we, we take in or we pay out. Right. Wh and which one? Well, 
that's the money that we spent out of the revolving oh, funds. Oh, okay. I well. see. So, so both. Right. Mm -hmm. But what we put into our budget that comes out of the way we put our budget together, right. that's the, the $600,000. $600. Okay. All right. And then this is other monies that we take in that Some we extend. Fees. So, so our total expenditure is about $864,000, mm -hmm. but about $600,000 of that is from the, the general fund. The general fund, okay. that's correct. And yeah, and so we get a good sense of how that has um, grown over the years from this. Some of the um, some of the um, revolving accounts, Mark, you gotta help me with this. There were big balances in those some of those accounts. Okay. What's going on? Is any of those <coughs> big balances in any of these um, athletic? accounts and if so what's the plan to spend them down marking i have a sort of perspective comment that one unconcluded conversation is there's a wish on some committee members parts to um possibly create a stabilization fund to deal with the bond on the athletic field mm -hmm. and that if and when we get come to a decision that yay or nay on having one it could well be that a significant amount of money in one of those revolving funds might go can we, we ship that money fund. from yes, if it's user user fees on your vote? Yeah. yeah. Huh. So we, we haven't really had that conversation, but in the finance committee it's been mentioned and it requires some large commitment to come to the town to say we'd like to have a stabilization fund. And we are not we haven't even started that conversation as a whole committee. And that's just for the field? For, for dealing with the bond for the athletic field, oh. and perhaps to put aside money so that when the artificial turf on that field needs to be replaced, needs to be replaced it's not a new bond that necessarily has to go to the towns, but we may be able to fund it because we've been accumulating fees over the years. Oh. So, so that's the reason why there is at least one fund that has a significant balance. So that's something we should be talking about during this budget cycle. Because to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of um, similar to that if we have if we have an overage in the healthcare line item, which, well, we did three years ago. That's how we started the OPEB. Why wouldn't we shuttle that over <coughs> to OPEB to a trust or or whatever? Because I don't want to say it's found money. You can put it towards good because you're just going to offset an additional expense at some point. I think that's what. Similar. It's certainly a conversation to, to come to, to have. An agreement. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I don't think it was. <coughs> I don't think it's a good idea to have money sitting in accounts when we're <coughs> scraping <coughs> for what we can, where we can. Well, maybe sitting, but we also know we have future expenses forthcoming, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. right. But I'm saying sense. use that, put that, in, put earmark that <coughs> for what it should, you know, something useful right. rather than just sitting there. Right. Correct. Any future school committee would say we want it all right. without because there's no particular <coughs> policy right. on that money at right. this point. I don't know if we want to get into the weeds about this, but what comes to my mind when I see uh, user fee for many of the schools is that parents paid into that with the expectation mm -hmm. that that money would offset the cost of their child participation. Right. So any money that's left in those accounts is parent parent <coughs> money and should be going for the kids. I, well, that's why I asked, can we right. really do that? Because I thought that that was... I, I, I think we have to have a conversation about it. I get some, well, my concern, I think I just expressed it, but also perhaps some ideas on, on how to perhaps make it to serve the purpose for which it was originally intended. Yeah, yeah. We can talk about that. Okay. We have to talk about that, because I think it's, the way it is now, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know. Okay, good. Well, at least we're in agreement on that. <sighs> Any other questions, comments? I want to force Susan and Elise <laughs> to say something at some point tonight. No comment. No <laughs> comment. Ah, <laughs> oh, she stole it. Um, do you have anything else you want to point us to? I did notice the. Um, this might not be PC, but it's the times we're living in. Um, I did notice the salary line item for the uh, athletic director, and I'm glad to see that this school <coughs> district did the right thing. That was big. Um, 
And if anybody wants to know what I'm talking about, you can look at the spreadsheet. But bring it up. Um, okay, anything else? Thank you for all of that work, Pat and Tanya. We really Thank appreciate you, it. Is there anything else that you'd like for Don't me? you <laughs> ask? <laughs> well, Neil's not here, so I don't know <laughs> the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> you did great with us. I think we're, I think we're in a good place. Okay. Tremendous work. I really do. If anything was up for the 20s, just let me know. No, and the great thing for the school district or the school committee is that you now have your formats, and hopefully next year yeah. it's not going to take. So thank you for more procedures. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Integrated pre-K pre program. I'm going to turn this over to Superintendent, Superintendent Clinch. Yeah. And I'm going to get uh, Alita to bring it up. I think she's doing that right now. Um, and basically, uh, this is just to give the school committee a, a, a sense of uh, the December 20th meeting. You'll recall that we um, had, had made the decision to host a parent information meeting that night rather than a school committee meeting. And you'll recall, too, that um, I had mentioned that this was an administrative evening, so it wasn't something that was necessary for school committee members to attend. I know a couple of you did, but it was certainly not my expectation that school committee members would attend. Yeah. There's nothing new. There was going to be nothing new presented that night. I know, Mark, you were there that, that evening. Um, I know, Lorraine, you were as well. There was nothing new presented out there, and so there's nothing new that I'm going to present tonight either, but I wanted you just to get a flavor uh, of um, uh, what, what we presented. Um, at that meeting, the same kind of group sat there as, as you had here tonight, too. Again, your elementary principals, Joan DeAngelis and uh, Sydney Maxfield. Uh, we're going to go quickly through this. I know that you can read, so I'm not going to read through. We did a broad overview as to one of, uh, of why we were taking a look at it. Uh, we broke it into three points. Uh, we had submitted questions. Um, that's uh, the submitted question component was um, I, I did that as a result of what we always did at the state level. We always had submitted questions um, rather than free flowing because then if you do free flowing, then there's a pension for somebody to take up more time than somebody else or whatnot. So we always had uh, with the commissioner always had submitted questions, and that way you kind of were able to attend or group. We got a lot of questions, for example, that were all basically similar around one theme. So I was kind of able to take like five cards and uh, rework the question and, and respond that way. Um, and then at the end, um, I thought it would just be five or ten minutes. That's not what happened. It turned out probably to be about 25, 20 minutes or so. Um, the, the principals and Joan and myself kind of took additional questions. I took the overarching questions. Joan were more specific with SPED, and then each of the principals were there um, to, to respond to uh, with any questions with regards to their communities. We'll, there we go. Um, why the review? We talked about the program reviews. I mean, it's not just pre-K that you've asked me to review. It's everything, including like the athletics and, and facilities and everything else. Pre-K just happens to be one of those. Um, I talked about the forensic audit, the fact that the forensic audit wasn't just about money. It was also about program improvements. You'll recall, for example, there was a, a list of uh, program improvements for special education that came out of that forensic audit. And we, we paid attention. We, we created the... Uh, corrective action plans, the caps for all of those, and went through those to do it. So I, ex I explained that, the district-wide purposeful planning, why uh, we, we take our time and we're thoughtful with the work that we're doing, and the fact that, as Lynn would say, this was a directive from the school committee. Uh, talked about the fact that we examined the current model, uh, the DESE guidelines, because that's that's really what we have to abide by. Uh, we took a look at the at the three <coughs> years of the NRSD trends, and then we charted our own data. One, of, excuse me, one of the questions that was asked, and I just want to put it out there, um, because I thought there, I thought it would be more complicated, but it's not. Somebody had asked about the number of special education children in the pre-K program over the last several years. And Joan and I had had some discussion on it. I don't think it's ever gone over 30 across the entire district mm -hmm. for the last three to five years. It's always been 30 or under, well, actually under 30. So uh, keep in mind that th that is the target of population that we have to look at in, in the terms of integrated preschool program within a public uh, school environment. Put up the definition of just integrated preschool just to remind folks what it was, which you all know talked about realigning of the community programs and that we want to make sure that our kids are in the schools where they're going to, so that they don't have to move between community and community in terms of their, their programming beyond pre-K. Uh, so we took a look at that. Read over some of the uh, frequently asked questions. Um, there weren't a lot of um, 
new questions that came to the table. There were some specifics, but very often those specifics were more about their own children. We may or may not have had an answer for them, to be honest with you. So we did we did our best because we really have to wait and see how the numbers are fleshing out. But I think, Joan, we were talking today, I think you should have letters out shortly um, w with regards to it. And um, basically, I mean, the programs are kind of all set now, to be honest with you. They, they fit very nicely uh, together once we got all the names in of all the parents. And I think we've heard from all of the parents now, we right? We have. We have. Yeah. Um, so there, uh, you've seen, again, the school committee has already seen the frequently asked question sheet, so we'll just kind of go through that quickly uh, to the next page. Talked about inclusionary models as the substantially separate classrooms and how those were different. Um, should there be a blend of three and four year old um, models in each integrated classroom? Uh, we typically have it. I think, I think somewhere <coughs> along the way, People thought that this was really a, a huge difference from last year, and it just, it just isn't. Now there are some spots that we're taking away. That that's a change. That is the change. The integrated pre-K model is not a change. Is what you've always had. <coughs> so that's not a change. How we man the pre-K uh, classrooms is not a change. So the the change really just comes in the the sheer number of of seats and. Uh, Keep in mind too that when we when we take a look at this, we I think there was a change of about 70 seats, but of those 70 seats, 52 of those were kids going into K. So that so I think that people think that maybe oh it was all of that, and it just it really wasn't. So just to kind of keep it in perspective. Um, so I think those are the key. Uh, uh, something else I, I just want to allude to too, and it kind of comes on the, the heels of was it Jolene, it's, uh, uh, the lady who spoke from Stowe. People talk to us about research, and I just want to uh, kind of put this out there. Um, school districts tend to follow very, very closely the research that is uh, provided to us by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. They have an entire unit that this is all they do. The reason I know that is because it was one of my units. <laughs> and so I know the unit very well. You have top-notch researchers in there. Some of them are educators and some are not, which is really interesting because it really keeps a really unbiased look at the research that they do. And it's not a case, I think sometimes people think if I Google this enough or if I put this term, that isn't really how research is done through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's very, very thoughtful. You've got a broad team that works not just within the United States, but globally, and they bring the information forward, and that's the information that goes to the, the Massachusetts Board of Education, where these decisions that we abide by are made. So I think sometimes they think, people think, well, did you do your re Well, our research isn't from Pi Delta Kappa, or AASA, or some of the, w which are highly respectful organizations, don't get me wrong, they are. But that's not the research that we as a school district depend on. We depend on the really outstanding quality research that we are provided by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So I, I know that really isn't something here, but it was a, a topic that just kind of floats out there and I thought I would just mention this. I'm sure that people don't even realize that that particular unit exists or what they do. But it's, and in fact, it's such a, it's such a solid unit. They present, they present across the country on what we do in Massachusetts for our research. So it, it's top, it's a top notch unit. So, uh, so that's in essence, um, I think we wound up, I want to say about quarter of eight that evening, 10 of eight. Uh, so I think it was, I think for what it was, I think Kathy, you had alluded earlier tonight, not everybody likes a decision that you make, and I understand that. And I think that, you know, if it was just philosophical, I mean, educators like myself always think more education is better. It doesn't matter at what level, whether it's postgraduate or whether it's pre-K, you believe in education or you don't do this job. Like, you, you just don't do it. You, it's in your fiber, it's in your soul. Um, so it's not that I don't believe in universal pre-K. I think there's a place for it for those people that, that want to take part in it. As a school district though, we have to juggle 
what we're mandated to do and I know how many other mandates we have to abide by that are unfunded far beyond pre-k mm -hmm. and we have to juggle all of that you know as we said uh, and this is not a, a new analogy but it, we talked about it again today around the, the table with the principals the pie is only this big and you can only divvy those pieces up in so many ways and we have as you had alluded to earlier a k-12 pre-k but k-12 spectrum that we have to really take a close look at so that that's that's it for me <laughs> I, I know it wasn't one of the questions, but could you add that description to the frequently asked questions about how oh, research about research in yeah. in the mandates, unfunded mandates? Oh, it well, been a question, is it really the unfunded mandates that, or was I think what I heard was the way that the, the department, department sets yeah. up. So, and really, in some ways, it's so that school district, I mean, they're also looking to create a continuum across the Commonwealth, right? And I, so I absolutely understand that. So that you don't have this school district over here <coughs> grabbing this and so-and-so over here grabbing this because there's, you're always going to have polarized viewpoints. It, no different than K. Some parents really want that full day K. Others do not. And, and they feel every bit as strongly about that. But it still has to be sustainable. Oh, for sure. Everything we do has to be sustainable. You're absolutely so right. So what does Jesse say about full day K? About free full day K? Oh. Universal K. I hate the word free. <laughs> Universal K. It isn't free. Pardon? It isn't free. No, it isn't free. That, that's okay. absolutely but right. But what do they say? You know, I don't know that I would But I don't want, I want to get the interpretation from the body. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, you don't have to attend, right? And so that also should send a signal. Yeah. And I, but it also has, there's also a pre-K and K curriculum, curriculum. as part of the curriculum framework. Oh, absolutely. Which is a new thing. Massachusetts is one of the few states mm -hmm. that has that. Right. But we have one of the best curriculum, if not the oh, no, best I, curriculum I across that, the country. But I'm just saying it's a mixed message. Yeah. Oh, know. definitely. Absolutely. I would say. Actually, that would be where I would come back to. I think it's a mixed message. But even if you look at how DESE and the EEC are combined, mm -hmm. because really, pre-K really doesn't even belong in that in DESE's bailiwick. It's really yeah. over here, right? You have the three branches of yeah. education. And pre-K almost really belongs over here. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the K to 12, and then you've got the higher ed, right? right. But there is a natural dovetail between the EEC and the DESE. So you have, to, you have to be aware of that. That's why there wouldn't be one body that you would go to to say, this is, this is it. But in almost, almost every year this comes up, and almost every year the same conclusion comes out, and you're from Jesse, so you might understand it better, but by the time the kids get into second grade, can you tell them apart? There's a lot of research. That's a that's a great question because we've had that discussion a lot around our table as well. And there's a lot of research that shows that actually it tends to tends even to look even out. out. Yeah. Now you're going to have some people that won't buy into that. No, and I get too. that, but it, it's almost like you know, as much as it, in all the swirl of conversation that goes on, it always comes back to that one thing: the second, they even right out. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's you know the kid's personality or just development or all right are we done with that let's um move on to subcommittee reports neil's not here kathy or mark either one of you i don't know the last time we met i think it's the last time we met i was sick and you were absent so there was right. okay so there's nothing <laughs> to report. no no report <coughs> all right and elise cpac no that's not a meeting until later this month. Okay. Correspondence. Um, clearly, I have gotten a lot of um, and had a lot of good conversations with people, but I won't go into it here. Um, but yes. a lot of verbal. Well, some email, a lot of coffees, more coffee than I think I probably could drink in a year, but met a lot of people that had a lot of really compelling information, really healthy dialogue um, and I really appreciate it. I still haven't heard from the group that runs the, the website which I find interesting. 
um, but I would certainly invite them, and I will not be meeting with large groups of people alone, given what's happened here before, uh, but I'd be happy to, to chat with them about some of the interesting things on that website or in the uh, invite-only Facebook page. Um, but I think those are kind of mellowing out. Um, consent agenda. Does anybody have any questions on the warrants or the meeting minutes? If so, if not, rather, we'll assume that those are good to go. And items for next agenda. The calendar is in the packet, as it is every single meeting. We've got, um, I don't know what's going to happen, Brooke, was, I think we're almost caught up. We are. So we've got another OPEP presentation coming in based on something you mentioned, you guys mentioned. That was, it's another firm meeting. that we're bringing in. The third and, and firm. Pat's, yeah, Pat's working on that. Yeah. There's also a, um, there's a Tritown meeting next week. It will be held in Lancaster. You can see an agenda. <laughs> Um, but um, just everybody, I'm not going to be here for that. Kathy's He's given us one I will attend. Yeah, well, not only will you attend, but you're, yeah. You're um, but just make sure that the, the meeting is still going to be held. Try to um, show your support mm -hmm. for our towns. Um, Can I, uh, I, would you be prepared to do your uh, mid-year progress on goals on the 17th? Yeah, I can. It's just verbal. It's yeah. 10 minutes. Thank yeah. you. So then we have... Um, Leachfield discussion and um, when will the insurance review happen? I think that's ongoing. Uh, Pat and uh, Anne Marie, I'm not sure, Anne Marie, the uh, insurance review. Okay, <coughs> we can't hear that, so <laughs> perhaps you can help us. There's a meeting scheduled later in the month. Okay. So that's something that, like, we, you know, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. We're looking for you to come to us with a couple different options based on the fact that we think that there might be some opportunity for cost savings there. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, I think that we're on the same page. Okay, good. I want to make sure. Um, and then the SOI. Um, yeah. You'll I'll see if, if all the information is out there, and, and I'm not sure how much is entailed in developing this SOI. It, I'm hoping it's easier rather than harder. It just depends on yeah. what I'm up against. All right, so I'm going to put that on here. All right. Mm -hmm. Lorraine, I, I, something to, to look towards is the sections of the policy manual, like those chips continue to chip away at that. Can I don't want it to interfere with the budget, but just if, no. keep that in mind if you have a light agenda. Well, whatever. you know what, Susan, <laughs> that's why January is so chalk well yeah. besides the fact yeah. that I moved all the <laughs> December right. 20th meeting minute meeting agenda items there but February and March are mm -hmm. fairly light okay. for yeah. the budget so I think the policy stuff is really important mm -hmm. um, so if you want to put it on put it on as long as we have oh at least a week to review yeah. big right. chunks yeah. and there will be a PRTF meeting next Monday there will be a PRTF Emergency, emergency response. response okay. Okay, good. Two weeks later, the health advisory. Okay, great. That's good. And then um, Brooke and Alita, the staff roundtables, we need to jump on that. And I think, Alita, you probably have all the content from the last time. Kathy and I need to look at the results of the survey from last year. And we might tweak some of those questions. But we need to start finding out when. And I thought I saw Kevin in here. Who was? Um, oh, there he is. Hi, Kevin. He's Hi. So <laughs> um, we need to start talking to the staff to find out when we can hold those staff round meetings. Ross has uh, graciously invited us to center school. Oh, that's great. Did he have a date? No, I don't think, no, I think he's got a pulse. Yeah, so you, I'll, I'll let you. Y'all handle that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything else? No, nothing. Um, actually, Susan, mm -hmm. is the next section really good? I can. We can get. We're almost done, so we, okay. we can basically do whatever you. If you have time for a short section, I can have that ready. Or it's just that the more time I have, the better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. she does a deep dive. No, I yes. like to yeah. 
That's fine with them. And so the next time we all meet will be the 20th for our um, budget workshop. Just FYI. Oh, so we'll meeting on the 17th. Oh, yeah. The next time we meet will be on the 17th. <laughs> The next time you will meet will be on the 17th. All right, I think that's it. I need someone to help us get into an executive session. I have a lot to do Mike here. Yep. Okay. All right, I move. Ready? Yep. All right, I move that we adjourn the regular meeting to enter into executive session to discuss receipt of and response to open meeting law complaint. Under purpose one, receipt of a complaint against a public body. Meeting will adjourn in executive session. And second. I knew you would. Mm -hmm. uh, who and so who will be staying? Brooke will be staying. Mike. <coughs> Mike and Marie. Is Anne Marie staying? No. She doesn't no, she doesn't. She doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish we could have all seen that look. Um, so it would include Brooke Clenchy and um, Mike McCarroll from mm -hmm. our BSC today. Okay, um, you, have you have to do the roll call. So me, yes. Kathy? Yes. Lynn? Yep. Elise? Yep. Susan? Yes. Stephen? Yes. And Mark? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Sorry. No, I didn't mean to.